George Latimer, Westchester County Executive, and welcome to our weekly update on Westchester County issues. This is Monday, September 12th, and we're very happy to have you here with us. We're going to go over a series of uh, items to give you an update on some issues, large and small. We have uh, representatives here from the Asian American Advisory Board, where we have a very uh, interesting story to tell, and Ken Jenkins, our Deputy County Executive, will help introduce that. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about some of the health issues that we've been dealing with, uh, some of the upcoming meetings and events, and we'll uh, close out by talking a little bit about uh, the 9-11 ceremony that we held yesterday at the Kensico Dam Plaza over in the area of the Rising. It was a, uh, a rainy day, tears from heaven, but uh, we had a very somber, but we hope a very connective moment for all of our Westchester residents. I'm going to update you on just a couple of issues that have been swirling around in the public. They don't uh, merit, at this point, a long discussion. You've heard some things uh, relative to a concern about uh, the, the reemergence of polio as a disease to be concerned about. And of course, we've had with the two and a half years of COVID infections, and then more recently, the monkeypox infections, a, a much greater focus on public health and the concern that diseases that are out there are uh, resurfacing in a way that uh, represents a problem for us as a society. Uh, we know that there was a case, an active case of uh, polio infection in Rockland County, dates back about three months ago. We have had no other cases of polio that have been discerned, but there is wastewater testing that has gone on, and they've detected uh, signs of the polio virus in the wastewaters of some neighboring areas, part of New York City, uh, Rockland and Orange counties have had such uh, situations. So, so you know where we are here in Westchester County. We, have, uh, uh, we are in the process of undertaking testing through the New York State Wastewater Surveillance Network. We are part of that. New York State Department of Health and the CDC who actually performs the testing. Uh, we are testing our wastewater systems in Westchester County to determine whether or not there's polio uh, virus detected in the wastewater of Westchester County. Uh, these samples are collected in a 24-hour composite. It's twice a week at each of our seven plants, and there are seven sewer treatment plants, four on the uh, Long Island Sound side, three on the Hudson River side. The samples are set to a quadrant in Syracuse, and the extracts are sent to the Wadsworth labs, and then on to the CDC that does the actual testing. Um, I am not a person of uh, great scientific knowledge. I do understand that both uh, Quadrant, the organization, the Wadsworth Labs, uh, have the technical capacity to look at the samples, determine tech, uh, technically, scientifically, whether there is traces of polio, and if so, at what level. And uh, they're also able to uh, uh, look for any information that would then inform us as to what presence there may be in Westchester. We are a county of over a million people, and uh, I don't know that I'd be particularly surprised if we're seeing things in other areas around us that, uh, that there isn't necessarily some trace of it in Westchester County. But as we get the reports back, we will certainly share that with you. We may have news by next Monday as to what the results of the uh, test samples will be, but the test samplings continue this week as they started last week, and uh, we'll certainly let you know. We have had no uh, active cases of polio determined in Westchester County, so we shouldn't treat this as if this is the next new pandemic to reach us. And in general, I must tell you that um, uh, we have now moved away from uh, a weekly reporting data on COVID and a weekly reporting data on monkeypox. In both cases, those two uh, infections are with us at some level of presence. The monkeypox presence is extremely low. I believe only two new cases in the last week, so it really isn't uh, uh, a, a concern that should be on people's tongues that they're worrying about it. We have active vaccination programs, certainly for COVID, that's been on, going on for uh, a year and a half since the vaccines were authorized in the early part of 2021. And the monkeypox uh, outbreak, we've had vaccinations for as well. We provide those vaccinations at our White Plains Health Clinic here at 134 Court Street in White Plains. Uh, if you believe that uh, you might be potentially exposed to monkeypox, and certainly if you're concerned about COVID, call the Westchester County Health Department Department and they will work out an appointment for you to come in and be vaccinated. There are many other places you can get vaccinations from as well. If you can get it through your medical doctor, uh, through the hospital nearest you, the neighborhood health center, by all means, you don't have to come through the county for that. You can use those conduits as well. But I think we understand that uh, in the case of COVID, certainly, uh, we're still uh, in the uh, meteorological summer in early September, and practically speaking, we're doing many things out of doors. So the likelihood of the virus spreading is lesser now than it may be a little bit later on. We will continue to monitor 
the extent of infections and the, uh, the extent of active cases and the severity of those cases, but we're still running a fairly low number of people hospitalized and we're running a, an extremely low number, under 1% of fatalities of all the people that contract COVID within Westchester County. There have been no fatalities to monkeypox and a very small cohort of people that are infected. So we think it's important for you to put these concerns into proper perspective, their concerns. We have public health professionals monitoring them, and, and we should practice good, intelligent behavior. If we are of advanced stage, I don't know if I hit advanced stage yet, I'm a senior citizen, but if you're of advanced stage, you're more vulnerable to these things. If you have underlying health issues, you're more vulnerable to these things. Uh, you might be in a particular um, a demographic cohort that might make you more vulnerable to these things, then you should take additional measures. But we are trying as a society to, uh, to fight these diseases, but not focus solely on them so that we can have uh, more of a normal uh, life. And I think we've been able to do that this summer. We hope to do that this fall. And we'll keep you posted on the progress in each of these different areas. And we'll certainly keep you posted on the, uh, on the polio sample situations. Uh, we're hopeful that uh, we'll have a full report of results next week. And if, uh, if we're not ready quite on Monday, then we'll have a separate press conference to be able to highlight that for you. Uh, we also want to give you an update on Westchester County Center. County Center now for almost two full years has been taken out of the business of providing recreation and uh, a general meeting place as it has been since it was built uh, right around 1930, give or take. It's a beautiful Art Deco building from the outside, but it was turned into a vaccination mecca during the heart of the COVID outbreak. And it did an amazing job as a physical uh, facility. And we appreciated the partnership with the state of New York, which reconfigured the building, uh, along with the help of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. We uh, administered vaccinations there through Westchester Medical Center. And, and the work that was done at one point, 2,200 people a day getting vaccinated at that center. We've also used it for antibody testing that preceded the vaccines being available. And so now we are reconverting it back to its original purpose. Uh, it's our estimate at this stage of the game, working with the New York State Office of General Services, that the county center will be back to its uh, prior usage by the end of the year, somewhere in and around the period of time, uh, uh, just before Christmas up through New Year's. We uh, are in dialogue with Section 1, which is the high school sports uh, consortium, and we're very hopeful that everything is in line for us to bring back for 2023 the high school basketball finals, the boys and girls finals, to uh, Section 1. Long before there was COVID, uh, we thought it was a source of great pride to have had them at the county center. We lost them for a couple of years. We came in and made the effort to try to bring them back. We brought them back, and right up to the beginning of COVID in 2020, we were able to have the, uh, the tournament there, and then COVID came in and everything went upside down. But uh, we're hopeful that the county center will be back online by the end of the year. And if that is true, and then we have the basketball tournaments there that we would expect in 2023 to have sort of a normal reint uh, reintroduction of the county center. Some of the trade shows that have traditionally been there, uh, some of the events and activities there will take time to get back to business. Now, we also know that that facility, which has not been renovated in a significant way in 40 years, deserves a full makeover, not just a, a restoration back to functional usage, which is what we're doing with the state. The state is going to restore it back to a functional use, uh, but to, to properly renovate it, to upgrade the services and facilities there, that's part of a public debate yet ahead of us. We're hopeful to have that debate over the course of the, the next few months and then uh, in dialogue with the Board of Legislators determine what the future of the county center will be, and that's tied into other things happening in the society. But for right now, we bring it back online as a workable facility uh, by the end of the year, uh, and we'll keep our fingers crossed that that will happen. We'll also mention that there's another major asset that does not belong to the county government, but belongs to the city of Mount Vernon, and that is Memorial Field. Uh, we expect uh, that uh, in the space of two weekends, I believe it's a week from this coming Saturday, that the first football game played by the Mount Vernon High School Knights, the, the name, the mascot name of the football team, will be on Memorial Field. That would be Saturday, September 24th. Uh, the field is uh, functionally complete. As I think I said a week ago, there's a couple of widgets and nuts and bolts that have to be tightened. That's just generic for uh, last minute details on a punch list. Uh, and uh, we're, we're extremely confident that the field will open. Now, to have a grand opening, to have a major celebration in the city of Mount Vernon with the pride that they have in having this field restored, uh, all of that is yet ahead of us. Uh, but the hard work has been done. The, the, the commitment to bring this field back, that commitment work was done. The financing was done. The design was done with community input, which adds a skate park 
to the original plan and the discussion of what should the scoreboard look like and what do we do with the tennis courts. All of those things are behind us and the construction work has been done. For 10 years, almost 12 years, there was a pile of dirt on Memorial Field. And, and what we didn't know until we got in there to do the reconstruction is there was debris that was buried there, some of it illegally. It was used as a dumping ground where it once was a mecca for entertainment, not just for sports, concerts. And since I grew up there and I'd been in that uh, field, in that stadium, if you will, many times as a young boy, uh, I remember what it was like in its prime days. And, and we all shed a tear to see what it became when, uh, when we went through that period of 10, 12 years where it lay fallow. Memorial Field is back. And we'll have more to say about it as we're ready for it. And put on your calendars, Saturday, September 24th, Mount Vernon Knights will be playing whatever high school team we root for, uh, just like putting basketball at uh, the county center. And we hope that Section 1 will take a look at the new Memorial Field as a place for their football finals. We are committing to uh, facilities that we know will serve our youth. And that is our responsibility as a government, not just to do what happens this year for this year, but to plan for the future and to have assets that will last a lot longer. So Memorial Field is on the way, and we're very excited about that. As part of that process, let me just mention <clears throat> that Westchester County operates on a calendar year fiscal year. And that is true for all of the towns of Westchester County as well. January 1st to December 31st is the fiscal year uh, for towns and for the county. Four of our six cities also operate on a calendar year fiscal year. Two of them operate on a mid-year calendar, as do villages, school boards, and uh, a couple of other entities. And when you have a calendar year fiscal year, that means in the fall of this year, we have to now start making plans for the 2023 county budget. This will be the fourth, fifth budget of our administration. And uh, we just want you to make a note that we include public input in the process. By the middle of October, on or about October 15th, we haven't established the day yet, we will complete uh, a proposed capital budget program, and we will submit it to the Board of Legislators for their review. The Board reviews it, makes alterations to it, uh, and at some point in time when they adopt the uh, operating budget, uh, they will then also uh, adopt the capital budget. And we have to lay before them what major projects do we intend to do in 2023, and then what do we project for the out years of 24, 25, 26, and so forth as the dates for those projects. When you see Mamaroneck Avenue paved uh, through Mamaroneck Village, Harrison, and White Plains, when you see a sewer treatment plant undergo major upgrade and improvement, as you've seen perhaps in Ossining and a couple of our other facilities. When you see us, uh, you know, make right the Sprain Ridge pools, that's, that's four years ago, or uh, the Miller House, that's three years ago, the historic Miller House. Each one of those are capital projects that have to be identified within a capital budget plan, and it's public, it's open to the public. So uh, that plan will be submitted in October of this year, and for those who are interested, you'll see it as a matter of public information, it'll be on our website and so forth. Then in November, uh, no later than November 10th, I think is the target date, we will submit an operating budget to the Board of Legislators for their review. And that's the budget that will include what most people want to know right out the bat is their taxes. What's the county tax rate? We have reduced the county property tax levy three consecutive years. Three consecutive years. We hope we can do it again, but we're not there yet, and we're doing our due diligence. We don't make promises because of politics. We look at the, the, the uh, expenses, and we look at the income, and we try to man, uh, maneuver and manage that process. And if we can come out with a fourth year of a tax decrease, we will. But what we also have to come out with is a budget that funds the necessary services and programs for this county. And those necessary services and programs are important. They're things that everybody does not rely on to the same degree. It's the maintenance of our parks. It's also making sure that we have an active and operating prison, that our bus system operates the way it should, and that our other physical assets are maintained and advanced. So mid-October, a capital budget, uh, early part of November, a operating budget, those things would be debated and discussed by the Board of Legislators. Uh, they have until late December to uh, uh, operate on it and make amendments and then vote and resend the bill to us for signature or, you know, other action that we might take, veto actions. We, we usually negotiate these things out during our tenure here, and we're hopeful that we'll do that again. But there will be two public input sessions for the public prior to our submission of the uh, operating budget. 
So there'll be an opportunity for you to attend. We'll announce the dates and places in October where you can come and speak conceptually. You won't have a budget in front of you. You'll talk about what you think the priorities of the county should be in whatever way they are. And we'll allow that public testimony and we'll also allow, invite is the better word, invite that public testimony and invite you to put in writing your more detailed thoughts. Uh, a person can get up to the microphone and say, cut my taxes, or you can sit down and give us a thoughtful memo about how you think things should or could be different. And we will absorb all of that and try to work in what we think is workable into the budget as we present it uh, to everyone else. So those are things that are happening uh, in the county uh, operations. And we'll keep you posted when we have those dates firmly established for the input sessions, as well as for the submissions to the Board of Legislators. And then once the Board of Legislators gets these budgets, they will then establish a series of public hearings and open public meetings to discuss and debate. The county level of government, like your local level of government, your school boards, your town, village, and city governments, county governments similarly, we have an open budget process. I serve in the state legislature. The state legislative budget process is not open to public input in the same way. And the federal budget process, I have not served in Washington, so I can't realistically comment on how that operates, primarily with continuing resolutions that doesn't really ever involve the adoption of a singular budget, but just sort of uh, enough legal authority to continue to do certain functions until it expires and, and either you shut the government down or you do another continuing resolution. That's not the way it works in the county. We're going to have a budget. You're going to be able to see it. You're going to see what's the income, what's the expenses, what's the mean in each department, and uh, you have some idea of how we're operating. And hopefully all of that will be of some help to you for those of you that want to have input in, uh, in government and the policy decisions that are being made. So I want to point out, as we go to the next topic before us, that we have a number of boards and commissions that cover a wide range of issues. And we've established specific uh, ethnic organization boards in which we invite people from different groups to come in who share a certain demographic to look at public policy issues from within that demographic. We have an African American advisory board. Uh, we have a Hispanic advisory board. We have a council for women. We have a council for seniors. We have a board for uh, people with disabilities. And with each one of these groups, we're asking individual citizens, no compensation, but uh, come and give us the best of your thinking as a volunteer citizen. And out of that, can we identify policy? Uh, can we identify programs? Can we identify targeted spending that we think is, is wise? So today we're here with uh, the leaders of our Asian American Advisory Board, a board that we recently uh, created a couple of, just a couple of years ago. And uh, they're here to issue what we think is a very exciting report. But to introduce that process, our Deputy County Executive, Ken Jenkins. Ken, thank you. Thanks, George. And, and, and certainly, um, based on the things that the county executive was just mentioning, um, talking through all of the things that have been happening with the county, specifically with our Asian American Advisory Board, um, the board was created in October 2019 um, as one of the, the newer boards that we created to formalize the relationship that we have with all of our community in Westchester County. County executive always likes to say Westchester starts with W-E. And that is what makes a big difference for all of us in Westchester County. Um, certainly today we have with us the uh, Executive Director of the Human Rights Commission, Teja Sanchala, and, and Martha Lopez, who in her other role as the Director of Minority and Women Business Affairs also serves as a liaison to the, African, uh, to the Asian American Advisory Board. So we're pleased this afternoon to have with us the, the leadership of that. So we're going to invite Marjorie Shu up to be with us, as well as all the other board members that are here. Her co-chair is David Imamura. Um, that, that is not here with us this afternoon, but, but please come up with me while I introduce all the things that we have going on right now. And members of the board, come on up. Right? And this is such an exciting time because during the, the summer and certainly during the, um, the festivals and the cultural festivals that we had um, at the Kensico Dam, we had a couple in a, a Ridge Road Park and, and moving around, that we had the opportunity to have on display all of the beauty of the culture of Westchester County. So today we're here with the Asian American Advisory Board members and they're going to announce an exciting launch of a community needs assessment for the folks in the Asian American Pacific Islander population here in Westchester County. So with that, let me turn over to a really good friend, Marjorie Shipp. Thank you. Good afternoon, it's my pleasure to be here this uh, afternoon. With me are uh, Koji Sato, Bhavna, and uh, Tony from our Asian American Advisory Board. Um, 
when David and Mamora and I uh, stepped up to co-chair the uh, AAAB, as I like to call it, uh, last spring, uh, we had the opportunity to meet with our county executive, and on our wish list was to do a needs assessment for the AAPI community. While we learned a lot about our Asian community in Westchester as a result of the 2020 census, um, there was a lot we didn't know. So, for instance, from the census, we know that the largest number of Asians live in Yonkers, and Greenberg experienced the largest um, numerical growth of Asians from 2010 to 2020. We also knew that there were seven communities that had it not been for AAPI uh, people moving into those communities, those communities actually would have shrunk. So um, I'm sure for anyone paying attention, Asian American Pacific Islanders are the fastest growing demographic, not only in Westchester County and in New York, but all of New, uh, the US and also the um, North America, so Canada as well as the US and uh, Mexico. So the, um, the survey has been launched and um, right now there's an English language version that we piloted at the Asian Heritage Festival and the Muslim Heritage Festival and the Indian, Indian uh, Heritage Festival at Kensico Dam this, uh, this summer. We're in the midst of um, doing translations so that the survey becomes accessible and um, uh, supportive of all members of our community. So it is being translated to Hindi, Urdu, Bengali, Japanese, Korean, and Chinese. And so um, it's all online. There's a QR code and a link that you can just uh, click on and it'll take only a few minutes to uh, respond to this online survey. And what we're trying to learn is uh, really, what are the unmet needs of our AAPI community? Um, we want to hear from senior citizens. We want to hear from new immigrants. Uh, we want to uh, hear from uh, low-income uh, folks that are moving from Queens into southern Westchester for affordability reasons. And we're very pleased to work with a... Um, a local uh, demographic researcher, Dr. Sheila Katsky, who in... Um, Later this year, uh, we'll take all the survey responses that we will have collected and provide us more insights in far, as far as the contextual and demographic research summaries, uh, the needs assessment, and then the community issues. Um, we've gotten quite a few responses to date, and we're hearing um, about need for more um, Asian history in uh, primary school curriculum. Uh, we always have a concern for language access. We want to learn more about health care concerns, transportation needs, and so we're very gratified to have the support of uh, County Executive Latimer and um, his team to get this survey done, and we're very much um, anticipating getting the insights so then we can, in fact, work on the policy um, that, uh, that um, County Executive Latimer uh, suggested. So thank you very much uh, for, for your support, and we encourage everybody to respond to the survey. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Marjorie. And, and we want to make sure to, to recognize again that, for as Marjorie pointed out, for our Asian American population here in Westchester co um, County, um, that population increased by 65. That we know there's 65,000 um, Asian residents in Westchester County. So it's critically important to get this information. And as County Executive continued to point out. We take that information from all of our boards and commissions and use that to help shape policy because it is a partnership with the Board of Legislators and during this budget process to take this valuable information, be able to distill it down and make sure that everyone feels included here in Westchester County. So thank you, Marjorie, and all of the board members and David um, as well for all the work that you all continue to do. And they've been at every one of the uh, um, heritage festivals, not just the ones that we mentioned with the survey, because our leader over the executive director in our Human Rights Commission makes sure that all of the members 
um, that participate um, for the boards and commissions, specifically out of our, our, um, our boards and commissions for diversity to ensure that everyone has an opportunity to see the volunteers in the great work that all you do. So thank you so much. And with that, we'll pass it back to the county executive. Thank you very much, Ken. Thank you very much, Marjorie, and, and all of her colleagues. Thank you for your service. It's very critical uh, to have you with us. And, and just as a general point uh, on all of these things, you know, we take very seriously some of those documents that we read about in elementary school, Declaration of Independence, um, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and uh, throughout the course of American history that follows uh, imperfect implementation by a society that is in the process of trying to perfect itself, trying to be better, to be a more small d uh, uh, democracy, and in so doing, uh, to make sure that the doors are open for people regardless of demographics. And uh, I think Dr. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King said it best, to judge a person not by the color of their skin, and you could extrapolate any other demographic into that, but to judge them by the content of their character. And so to the extent that we have this board and other boards that look at these issues, uh, identify strategies that we can uh, use to make this uh, a more inclusive county, the we in Westchester, uh, we're happy to have that. And hopefully we'll find concrete ways to make that happen in the days to come. So thank you again very much for that. And Ken, thank you for your leadership on this. It's a very important part of this. So uh, we mentioned there are some dates uh, to uh, keep in mind. We have another date tonight, if you have free time. Uh, we have um, uh, coming up, not tonight actually, coming up tomorrow night, Tuesday night, September 13th. Uh, we have the uh, latest in a series of public forums on the, on the future of the Westchester County Airport. It's been described as on the horizon, which is a nice marketing way to talk about what it is that uh, we hope to see happen at the Westchester County Airport. Uh, for the immediate uh, purposes of your calendar, tomorrow night at 7 p.m., we have the latest in a series of forums uh, at Harvest Time Church. That's at 1338 King Street in Greenwich, Connecticut. And if you know the geography of King Street, King Street is a street that borders the town of Rye, village of Rye Brook, on one side, the western side, and the town of Greenwich in Connecticut on the eastern side. It is a, it is a border street. So 1338 King Street is right there on the Westchester, Connecticut border. We've established this particular venue in Greenwich uh, at the recommendation of uh, the Honorable Fred Camillo, who is the first selectman for the town of Greenwich. And uh, the FAA, Federal Aviation Administration, expects to see Westchester County, which owns the Westchester County Airport, uh, to look at all of the possible users of the facility, not just those that live in Westchester County. And while we oper own, and own the land and operate the ground services, it's the FAA that controls the skies, and they set the rules of operation. And on almost every major thing that happens at the airport, if the FAA is not in agreement with it, they can stop it from happening since they have the superior authority as a federal government. So uh, in so doing, we wanted to make sure that we reached out to our Connecticut neighbors, gave them an opportunity to come and be heard on the issues of the day. Now, in the master plan, we're dealing with very specific areas of, uh, of consideration and analysis. We have a terminal for commercial use. And then on the uh, western side of the airport, there are fixed-based operators that uh, provide services for general aviation. General aviation is private jets, uh, small airplanes, uh, two four-seater airplanes. Commercial airlines are the ones that come to the terminal, which you're familiar with, where the JetBlue flies in and out of there, other major airlines. So. Uh, the airport is a combination of the future of both of those level of facilities. The master plan looks at parking. The master plan looks at how do we handle uh, uh, water runoff, uh, drainage, uh, how we handle de-icing fluids, the collection and proper disposal of de-icing fluid. It's a toxic product. You cannot just let it drain off into the Blind Brook and find its way down to Long Island Sound. We're very concerned about the impacts on the drinking watershed. And people say that all the time. Don't you realize that there's a drinking watershed right to the airport? Well, of course we do. The airport was built, uh, you know, prior to World War II. And uh, it was determined at that day and age to have what was then a military facility there, I assume for civil defense protection during World War II. But that's where the airport was developed. We, we come into the uh, decision-making roles to try to deal with the airport and make it as good a neighbor as we can. There's been no documented pollution of our drinking watershed from the airport, and this administration has worked very hard to deal with that by reestablishing testing wells and then making sure that working with the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation that we take remedial uh, actions to deal with any uh, long-term PFAS pollution, make sure it does not affect the drinking watershed, 
There were PFAS products used at the airport back in the 1980s for practicing firefighting uh, at uh, airport facilities uh, for planes if there was a plane fire. And uh, the material that they used uh, had within it uh, potential pollutants, and when those pollutants hit the ground, uh, they didn't disappear. They, they uh, exist for a length of time, and they move underground as, uh, as things seek out the lowest level. So we have been diligent about trying to deal with that. That's part of the master plan, a host of different issues. In these public forums that we've had, we've had, uh, I think, five in-person forums. Uh, we've had one virtual one, and we've had them in some of the different areas. We had the most recent one a week ago in Chappaqua. The majority of people that are coming out to speak are those people who live in proximity to the airport, under a flight path of the airport, and they're extremely upset by the air traffic overhead and the noise and the disruption to their lives. This is an important input, and this is an issue we have to address. Now, we don't have the control of the skies. The FAA does. We can't say, oh, we'll set different patterns of how planes should land at the airport. That's not within our control. We address the issue in our master plan at some level, and then we use that as a lobbying document with the FAA. But it's also important to note that there are many issues involved in the airport, not just airport noise by the neighbors. But circumstances as they are, the people that are most aggrieved by something are the ones that are usually, you know, the most verbal. So we've opened the door for written testimony uh, on, on the future of the master plan, and this is input that we get before we prepare the document. Now, this is not what you usually get in government. Usually a document is prepared, a budget is prepared, and you comment off something written. What we've done, we've done this on the budget, I just alluded to it a few minutes ago, and we've done it on some other areas. This is getting public input before we craft the document itself. And while some people say, well, what am I commenting on? You're commenting about how you feel philosophically or directly about the future of the airport. And there are people that in the airport, it's noisy. There are other people that use the airport as a place to travel on business. And there's some people who use it for leisure travel. And some folks work at the airport. And, and they're Westchester res residents as well. And we don't say this person's interests are more important than the neighbors or less important than the neighbors, but we want to hear all the inputs, and that's what we're striving for. So as we have this hearing tomorrow night, 7 o'clock, Harvest Time uh, Church in Greenwich, Connecticut, uh, we will probably suspend having any other immediate uh, public input sessions as we now start to work on the document. We have a consulting agency that's doing certain research that are, is required. The FAA will require us to do projections of demand on the airport. We'll have to put that statistical data in. Uh, and then when we have a draft document, that draft document will be released publicly. I assume we'll put it up on a website when that happens, possibly late October, maybe early to mid-November, whenever that document is there. And then that will be a source of commentary as we look at and write language. As an example, we have a voluntary uh, curfew at the airport at 12 midnight. It's voluntary because that uh, we had imposed 40 years ago a mandatory curfew. The airlines took the county to court and won in court. The county does not have the authority to put in a mandatory curfew. So when flights come in after 12 o'clock at night, the county has no legal ability to stop them from coming in. But a voluntary curfew is one that we then use uh, as many resources of persuasion as we can to try to reduce the amount of, of flights that come in after a certain time. And we've had success in making sure there aren't planned flights that come in, such as on an airline schedule on the commercial side, but we have no particular leverage over the general aviation side. And so we're trying to work with the various players in the game. And in the master plan, we hope to come up with some strategies that are used at other airports. There's very few airports that have a mandatory curfew in the nation. The FAA in general, you know, doesn't prefer that. Um, but we'll try to use the best case scenario as we see it in different places. We know that there are some people for whom the expansion of the airport is what they want to see, however large or small that group is. And there's a group of uh, people in Westchester County, however large or small it is, who would like to close the airport down. And they have a wide variety of re reasons for both of those two points of view. We listen to all points of view. But we have to try to come up with a document that will have the consensus support of the Board of Legislators and will pass muster with the FAA. We do ourselves no good to give them a document that we know they'll reject uh, sight unseen because we're playing to, you know, whatever the, um, you know, the immediate circumstances are. So we're going to try to do our, our dead level best, keeping in mind that there are legitimate business interests at the airport, but there are very legitimate residential interests in and around the airport, and keep all those in some sort of a harmony. Uh, you can judge how well this administration has operated on a host of issues, whether or not we've improved our capital projects in the parks area, 
We built the New Rochelle Family Court, which was long kicked around as a football. We're just now delivering Memorial Field as a completed project. What we've done on the legislative side and a host of different areas, we are certainly not perfect, but we are trying to do our dead level best, and I think that's what we intend to do in the airport. And if you'd like to come out in person to express your thoughts tomorrow night, Tuesday night, September 13th, 7 p.m. at Harvest Time Church, 1338 King Street in Greenwich, Connecticut. And then at that point, we'll invite your written testimony, and we'll look forward to going from there. Next, we want to talk about a uh, project uh, that is uh, underway or will be underway at Muscoot Farm, which is one of our great county holdings uh, in the town of Somers, and Ken will cover that. And thanks, George. In the adopted 2022 capital budget, there was approximately $476 million of capital projects, some of those at the airport, about $150 million of those were uh, for sewer and water um, infrastructure, and $300 million approximately was done for the general operating. This is another exciting opportunity, as County Executive just alluded to, with the kind of projects that we continue to invest in in Westchester County, and whether that's on Mamaroneck Avenue or at Memorial Field, that you get to see the kind of investments that we make across the board in making sure our nationally accredited park system continues to stay that way for the enjoyment of everyone. People that came to, uh, to Kensico Dam yesterday to participate in the rising saw the result of a capital project that was done last year with the 9-11 um, related illness memorial that was done last year. Another capital project that the county it led by County Executive Latimer invested in to ensure that we were recognizing and, and taking care of everyone. This particular one is at Muscoot Farm at the main farmhouse, the main house restoration that's underway. It's a $1.9 million capital project, and the majority of this project focuses on the exterior of the house, including the restoration of columns, sidings, the windows, the roof, the railings, and terraces. We are doing some additional work inside that includes repairs to the windows, doors, walls, and floors. Most people think of, of Muscoot Farm, but we also know that it's also known as Al, Al Del Bello. It's named after Al Del Bello because of the work that Al Del Bello did, especially with um, our farm animals and getting that park environmentally inside of the county system to be able to have an educational opportunity for our young folks and participation and cooperation with Cornell Cooperative as well. So um, we're going to continue to do those kind of projects that we're investing in right now. I think we're up to $153 million of investment at Playland Park. That's the largest single investment ever in a park system in Westchester County. And again, it shows how much work was uh, stacked up on the, the runway, to use an airport term, for the projects that we have to do for Westchester County. Some of them are safety and security. Some of them are for the continued enjoyment of Westchester County residents. And it's the kind of investments that you know that your county is working on, as well as being able to balance, as County Executive continues to point out, in three years in a row of tax decreases. So we're able to do those investments. We don't have the similar issues that we've heard about water issues around, uh, around the country, whether people have not invested in those kind of things. Your county continues to do that, and everyone working together to make sure that Westchester County is revitalizing all of its infrastructure and make it the destination for de de decades to come. This is another great example of this here at Muscoop Farm. Back to you, George. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. So let me uh, close out with a couple of uh, issues uh, fairly quickly. We understand that uh, those who watch the full report uh, are the few and the many may click on, may not click on at all, but at least it's here as input if you want. You can certainly look at this uh, on Facebook uh, as you, if you want to get some information. We have reestablished Bicycle Sundays for the fall months of September and October. Last uh, Sunday, yesterday, was the first time that we've had it since the end of July. Uh, the program is on Sundays from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. on the Bronx River Parkway. We close the Bronx River Parkway in the north at the Main Street exit in White Plains, downtown White Plains exit, and we close it at the Scarsdale uh, road exit, uh, which is actually in the city of Yonkers, and it's the exit where you go uh, to the east and head into downtown Tuckahoe, and if you go to the west, you're going to Asbury Memorial Church, then into the Crestwood section of Yonkers. That strip 
which goes alongside uh, Garth Woods and the Garth Road area next to it. Goes uh, right through the heart of downtown Scarsdale, great place to get off and you know stop if you're going to stop while you're bicycling. And then up through the large S curve just south of uh, White Plains. Uh, we'll be open for recreational runs. Uh, it'll be open uh, the next couple of weekends, September 18th, September 25th, October 2nd. Uh, this program is made possible uh, not merely by our Department of Parks and Recreation, but also by the Westchester Parks Foundation, which makes a major financial contribution so that we can do this. And we have partners and generous donations from other sponsors, New York Presbyterian, Lawrence Hospital, Con Edison, BJ Wholesale Club, and uh, radio station WHUD. They are all supporting partners of making this happen, and we appreciate their financial assistance in doing this. We think that this is a lot of fun. During the course of uh, COVID, when we didn't have other recreational opportunities, we kept Bicycle Sunday operating. We got record numbers the last couple of years, and uh, we hope it's a, a great way to reintroduce it. Um, again, uh, we, it's exit 22 down to exit 4. Uh, the round trip is 13 miles, which is a healthy little drive, and uh, the road is close to automobiles during that stretch of the parkway. So if you're thinking the Bronx River Parkway is part of your route for something on Sunday, use the Sprain Parkway if you can. Use Route, two, uh, route 22 through Scarsdale and East Chester. Use Central Avenue, but don't plan on the Bronx River Parkway. The bicyclists will have it, and, and they, as well they should on these upcoming Sundays. Also on your calendar, September 23rd at 2 p.m. at the Kensco Dam Plaza, we will be recognizing Gold Star Mother's Day. Gold Star Mother uh, is, is those women who sadly lost a child, son or daughter, uh, in the service of our country through the military. And the Gold Star Mothers have made a tremendous sacrifice by losing their loved ones. You can just imagine what you go through childbirth uh, into raising a child in those infant years and you watch them grow as they take on uh, all the joys of childhood, graduate high school and you feel very proud of the young man or woman that you've raised. And then Uncle Sam uh, asks them to uh, serve their country, and then you lose them, and they don't come back, and then you don't get the chance to see them married. You don't get the chance to see grandchildren. You don't get the chance to enjoy them in your, in your far senior years and to have that young adult child be there for you. They're gone. And so we recognize those Gold Star mothers who've made a tremendous sacrifice alongside of the ultimate sacrifice made by their children. We honor them uh, in Westchester County. I believe there's a flyer to show you some of the details. You're welcome to give us a call, and we're happy to um, highlight that for you. The 23rd of September uh, at uh, 2 p.m. at the Kensico Dam Plaza. And uh, yesterday, just to close out our report, we had uh, our annual 9-11 uh, ceremony. We had uh, back uh, in the late uh, 2000s the creation of a marvelous sculpture. It was during the tenure of my predecessor, County Executive Andy Spano, and he had outside uh, resources. Jim Houlihan uh, was very active in the business community, real estate community, led a group of individuals to raise money to create a magnificent statue to honor uh, those that we lost that day uh, on 9-11 at the World Trade Center. It's a triangular uh, a statue in a circle and it rises with a peak and it has the outer skin that evokes the outer skin of the World Trade Center for those of us who remember that. And then around the base of the 111 names, individuals individually identified in separate um, uh, areas to show their name and a little bit about them uh, and the lives that they lived prior to losing their life on that day, September 11th. So we have that honoring. That's going on for a number of years. We have added last year and now this year a wall of remembrance uh, where we add names for those people that have died from 9-11 related illnesses. Those are people, primarily first responders, who went down on the pile. And uh, without knowing, I don't know that anybody knew exactly what kind of chemicals were involved in the collapse of the towers, they were there to search originally for those survivors and then to uh, try to recover that which could be recovered afterwards so that there's some closure in the families and there was some ability to take that site and um, uh, create a new future out of that site, even as we remember the tragedy that happened on that day now, 21 years ago, which is hard to grasp. So the wall of remembrance is there. We added names this year as we have in the past. We've changed a little bit of the look of it so that it, it stands out more. And it's very emotional. We were there Saturday with uh, members of the family who came to look and they got etching paper and they etched the name of their loved ones, much as I've seen at the Vietnam Wall down in the Washington, D.C. Uh, mall. 
and uh, we think it's a proper respect for the 9-11 first responders and, of course, for those individuals. Uh, we had a wonderful ceremony. I want to thank uh, publicly uh, members of our Parks Department, our County Police Department, our Public Safety Department that were essential in that program. We had uh, some representatives of our Emergency Services Department that were there. And here, from the County Executive's Office, our Cracker Jack Communications Department, all hands were on deck. Catherine Chaffee, uh, Carolyn Fortino, Joe Scamato, Lisa Reyes, Chelsea uh, Pagano, uh, just, just a host of effort made to create uh, a really important ceremony. Uh, we were very pleased to have Lisa LaRocca from News 12 Service RMC. We had elected officials, our County Board of Legislators, uh, and uh, representatives of state and our federal legislators, outgoing Congressman Mondier Jones was with us. And uh, we also had um, representatives of the major faiths to share their, from their faith tradition to help us all try to deal with what isn't a governmental response, but a human response to the tragedy of 9-11. Uh, I had got to share some comments that are shown uh, in the video that, uh, that, that is also on the Facebook page and, and some greater detail. I need not repeat all of it. Except to talk about in that message, that message of unity that comes from having a shared fate. Because what happened that day, and you could see it when you walk around the monument and you see the names of each of the people, it lists the date of birth and the date of death. And the date of death in every case was the same day. And you look at the names that, are, that we remember, O'Sullivan, Palazzo, Friedlander, Balofsky, uh, Rivera and Rodriguez, uh, we see a diversity of names, Briley, Nakamura, and, and some of those names, first names were John and Gary, some of the first names were Gwen and Helen and Joanna. Uh, we had people there of all different demographics, and you can't tell by just looking at it, you know, who's tall and who's short, who's fat, who's skinny. It doesn't tell you who was a Presbyterian and who was a Methodist and who was Catholic and who was Jewish in the Reformed tradition or Jewish in the Orthodox tradition or Hindu or Buddhist. It doesn't tell you anything about the sexual orientation of the individual. So what it does tell you is that all the people that day shared a common fate on a single day. On a single day, they all shared the same fate. And it reminds us in a divisive moment, which we are in, <laughs> we cannot lie, it's a divisive moment in this society where we have our disagreements on philosophy and political philosophy. We are so angry with each other that we unfriend each other on Facebook. We are so angry with each other that when we have a family gathering, a cousin can't talk to an uncle, and uh, you just like you don't go there or you don't even invite both of them at the same time. Uh, we're at a point in the society where we have worked the divisions between ourselves to the great extent we will forget that we have so much more in common. And the things that we have in common uh, is what links us, and not just as Americans, but as human beings, because we're all mortal. We all live here for a certain amount of time, and most of us will depart on dates different from the rest of us, unless there's a tragedy like this that takes 3,000 of us at once to remind us of our common humanity. And it's the common humanity that we have to work toward dealing with. Because I assure you, as I said yesterday, I know I'm repeating myself for those who heard it, we are all together on the 107th floor at the same time. We are all climbing those stairs, all of us, at the same time. We are all on Flight 93 all at the same time. Our fates are intertwined. Whether we like to believe it, we don't like to believe it. The other person looks different from you, worships different from you, has a different political philosophy from you. No matter how much you might disagree or dislike them because of those things, doesn't matter. We're all there together. And we have to figure out uh, how we're going to find the things that are in common. And if we don't do that, no matter how many ceremonies we have, we disrespect the memory of those people that died that day. And uh, we, we want to show proper respect to them. So I share that with you as we close our presentation today. We are on to different public meetings and different public forums. Uh, we are here to do the work of this county as well as we can, as best as we can. If we make mistakes, we'll fix them and we'll try to go in a different direction. But we do it understanding that this is the test. This is the test of, uh, of governance, whether we can govern ourselves. And we have to prove that we don't need a dictator. We don't need somebody telling everybody how to live, that we ourselves can find a way to do it together. I'm George Latimer, Westchester County Executive. Thank you for watching. Have a good day.